Hello, this is Nadej Cezana. I go by Nan, and I'm the craving coach, helping you conquer your food cravings for good. And in this series right now on YouTube, I'm telling you, I'm explaining to you, we're exploring why it may be more interesting actually to conquer our food cravings for good rather than focusing on weight loss. And I'm going to explain today, um, and I'm going to give you three questions that are going to change your, to blow your mind, to change your life. So I'm really inviting you to grab a notebook and a pen and write them down. Here we go. So what if weight gain was actually not the problem itself, but rather the symptom, the effect of another problem? What if weight gain was just the tip of the iceberg? And losing weight, uh, whatever approach we, we choose, whether it's diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's both, whether it's um, surgery, medication, this is not going to change the reason we eat, and that's super important. So we want to find the root cause so that we can actually treat it, why we gain weight, or else if we don't find the root cause and heal it, change it, cure it, then it's just like applying a band-aid on a broken arm. It's not going to solve the, the issue, it's on the contrary, it's going to make it worse. So why do we eat more than we need? This is the root cause, this is the issue, right? We eat more than we need, this is why, as a consequence, we gain weight. So the idea is that instead of losing weight again and again, we actually stop gaining the weight in the first place. And we change our behavior so that there's no need to lose weight anymore. Isn't that clever? <laughs> or as I like to say it, I like to use the analogy, why mop the floor when you can turn off the faucet or the tap, right? Instead of mopping the floor and dealing with a weight gain, what about solving the issue of why we first overeat in the first place. So what makes us eat more? Well, here are two clues that are super important. I really want to, you to pay attention to that because it's going to change everything for you. First, when we do anything, it's because of the way we feel, right? If I feel down, then I'm going to probably want to <laughs> buffer, want to distract myself with Netflix, with my phone, with food, right? That's the first thing. When we do anything, it's because of the way we feel. The way we feel is a clear uh, indication of the way we're going to act, behave, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is that when we do anything, it's because of the way we want to feel, right? So for instance, if I go back to my example of feeling down, if we reach for the food when we're feeling down, it's because we think we'll feel better, right? But let's examine what's going on because maybe we could feel good in the first place and we want to keep on feeling good. So that's when, that's what we do when we actually celebrate with food. We think food has the power to make us feel good longer. And that's certainly the story I have with chocolate, right? Let's celebrate, let's have some chocolate. Some people have champagne when they want to celebrate and there's nothing wrong with that except if that's not what they want, all right? And as I was saying, when we feel blue, we want to stop feeling this way. So we turn to food to feel better. It makes perfect sense, right? Lots of people do that. Or when we have an uncomfortable emotion, and it could actually be a pleasant one or an unpleasant one, just because we're not used to actually feeling that emotion, then we turn to food to make the discomfort go away, right? So we want the discomfort to change we want to feel better. So whatever the emotion we're feeling or the emotion we want to feel, we think food is the solution. But is it true? <laughs> Can food actually change the way we feel? So sure, that's the first thing. Sure, of course, when we eat, uh, eating mess makes us feel different because of the chemical reaction, because of the interaction be between the food and us, right? Our body gets into contact with something external, the food, and yes, of course, we react to it physically with simply the five senses. So perhaps, let's take the example of bacon. We can smell the bacon in the pan. We can hear its crispy sound. We can see it turning brown. We can touch it with our fingers. We can lick our fingers with our tongue and we can taste the bacon in our mouth, right? So it makes perfect sense that yes, eating changes the way we feel as far as sensations are concerned. But what about emotions, right? Can eating bacon, chips, chocolate, whatever, 
can it actually change the emotions that we feel? And an easy way for us to find out is to actually slow down and notice how a particular food, bacon, crisp, pizza, whatever, actually makes us feel, emotionally speaking, right? And that's why I love about mindful eating. It allows us to see the stories that we have and we believe about our favorite foods, for instance. It helps us sort the stories we want to keep from the stories we want to get rid of. And so that's what I did as far as chocolate is concerned. Thanks to mindful eating, I let go of a lot of chocolates that actually I didn't like. I thought I liked. I had stories that I liked. But I kept this one chocolate that's really, each time I taste it mindfully, yes, I'm still filled with pleasure, right? So I also had this story that cookies were absolutely amazingly delicious. So I wrote down everything I was expecting a cookie from one of the most famous bakeries in Paris, Kaiser. And basically to sum up, I was expecting uh, the cookies to, to have this magical effect on my life, like a merry-go-round of endless ecstasy. That was the simple exp expectation I had on those cookies. But unfortunately, it turned out that I felt joy and anticipation when I was thinking of getting the cookies, when I had bought the cookies and my way back home from the, from the baker. And I was holding this precious little parcel in my hand as I was anticipating it. And, um, and then I beat into the cookie. And yes, for the first, second and third bites, usually it felt amazing. But then the truth is that after the fourth bite, I had actually tuned out. I wasn't even thinking about the cookie anymore. I was somewhere else with my head, right? So I was no longer ever, ever even present with that supposedly magical cookie, right? I was no longer feeling joy and yet I was still eating the cookie, but it was mechanical. I was absent-minded actually. So that allowed me to see that the cookie actually didn't have this expected magical effect on my life. The cookie couldn't make me feel joy or satisfied or fulfilled in any way, right? So I'm really inviting you to do this exercise for yourself. Decide a food that you're going to eat and write down everything you think about the food and what you expect the food to make you feel, right? Write down for simply five minutes. So take a pen, a notebook or a piece of paper, it doesn't matter. Set your timer for five minutes and simply write down everything that comes to mind when you think about that particular food. Then go and get the food and similarly try to write down as much as you can what you actually think as you eat the food, right? And um, of course I have a worksheet just for that that I use with my clients so that they can really get super deep and they get so much awareness, so much from this, from this work. But it doesn't matter if you don't have this worksheet, you can do it on your own. All you have to do is follow those simple steps. Simply write down what you think you're going to get from the cookie, the cookie or whatever the food is, and then actually write down what's the real experience is for you, right? And it all boils down to this, a food, whatever the food is, whoever made it, whenever you eat it, it can never ever make you feel differently as far as your emotions are concerned. It's impossible, right? And it's very good to know because what we're looking for in the food can never be found there. It's never there, right? The emotion we want to feel when we turn to the food is never going to be there. We can never find an emotion in the food. We think we do, but it's impossible. So even if we uh, were comforted with pain au chocolat after school when you were a kid, uh, by well-meaning grown-ups who did believe pastries could make you feel better, even that, that was a story, all right? A well-intended one, a well-meaning one, but a story. So instead of treating the symptoms, as I said, of overeating, that is weight gain, like mopping the floor instead of turning the faucet, I'm really inviting you to get curious as to why you eat when you eat more than you want to, right? So first question, remember, which emotion are you currently feeling when you reach for the food? Like, what is this emotion that makes you reach for the food? And the second question is, which emotion do you want to feel instead or keep on feeling for longer 
thanks to the food. Or at least that's the story in your mind, right? It's like a before and after picture, but instead of the usual weight loss, it's more about what you want to gain thanks to the food. So I've realized recently, to give you an, another example, that I felt obligated or pressured when I saw the food plan I had written the day before and the food that I don't want to go bad. All right. So that's really the story in my mind. It's just like, OK, I have to have this because it's what I had planned. And also I have to have this food because if I don't eat it right now, then it's going to go bad. And really what I want, instead of feeling pressured or obligated, what I want from eating the food that's about to go bad is to feel virtuous because I want to think I've done the right thing. Right. But the thing is that eating the eating food when I'm not hungry, out of obligation, out of pressure, because I want to feel virtuous about myself, because I want to tell myself I've done the right thing. Well, eating food, even if it's on my plan, is not going to make me feel virtuous unless I think it does. Right? It's an inside job. It doesn't come from eating the food. So my realization was that I could feel virtuous by thinking I've done the right thing, by actually doing something else, by actually checking in with my body. Am I hungry? Am I not hungry? And deciding that I'm not going to eat if I'm not hungry. That also can make me feel virtuous because I can also think in that situation, I've done the right thing. It's a game changer. It's been a game changer for me, right? So maybe that's also an issue that you found for yourself and let me know if that helps you. So if we go back to those two questions that I'm inviting you to consider, if you ask yourself those two questions on a regular basis, so what emotion am I currently feeling and what emotion do I want to feel thanks to this food? If you ask yourself those two emotions, I promise that your life is going to change in ways that traditional weight loss, traditional weight loss diets could never give you because the rewards are endless. I'm just going to list a few and that's going to be already so much, so much more than weight loss diets. So your life is really technically going to change in two, two ways, the tangible, the external, the visible ways and the intangible the invisible, the internal ways. So let me explain. There are two things, two ways we can see the change. First, what you get. And the second thing is who you become. If we focus on what you get, we can focus on what you as a person get actually, but also what you get for your family or what you get for society, for instance. Okay, we can zoom out from you to the circles, the circles of people around you, right? And we can zoom out more and more, right? If we focus on you and what you get for yourself by conquering your food cravings for good, by simply asking yourself those two questions, well, let's start with money. <laughs> if you no longer buy junk food because you don't see the point anymore, you know what you're looking for in the food, in the junk food, and you know that you're never ever going to find it there, then of course you're going to save money, right? And of course you'll you'll stop gaining weight because you'll stop eating extra calories that your body doesn't need. And it will mean that also you'll probably be more dynamic, but more flexible. Like for instance, you'll be able to go up the stairs without being short of breath, or you won't be afraid of breaking a chair. I know that was a huge thing for one of my clients when you see that. Or maybe you will go back to riding a horse, which is one of your favorite things, but you haven't been able to do that for fear of hurting the horse, right? So you're going to lose weight if that's what you want, or you're going to maintain a stable weight instead of going up and down the scales. So you're your dieting, whether you're binge eating and then restricting and binge eating again, restricting this never ending story, right? No, you'll be able to maintain a stable weight, right? You'll get healthier along the way, as you can see, maybe how your skin is glowing more and more, your eyes are shining, all because you're taking good care of yourself. Also something super fun that my clients have realized is that you'll notice how your jeans fit better and how you can fit into smaller clothes, which by the way, when you order by mail, you know, through via catalogs in France, uh, smaller clothes are actually cheaper than bigger clothes, which means that you're also saving money. Isn't that fun? So you'll also be able to wear clothes that you really want to wear. It's not going to be the, 
the least unflattering clothes that you can find, but you'll get really to choose what you want to look like instead of trying to be invisible and not to offend anyone with unflattering clothes. And the good news is that you can, you will be able to keep those same smaller clothes instead of changing your wardrobe on a regular basis, depending on where you are on with your weight, depending on your weight fluctuations. So again, you'll be able to save money. Maybe you'll be able to drop the medication that you're currently having because of the weight loss, right? Maybe you'll be able to take care of your uh, weight-related illnesses in a different way. So again, you may be able to save money not having to buy medication. Same thing, you'll, you'll save time also because you won't have to go to the chemist. And of course, that means saving energy because you won't have to go, actually physically go to the chemist. And let's imagine, speaking of time, how much more time you'll get to take care of what truly matters to you rather than dealing with this issue of weight because maybe you won't be spending 40 minutes to go to your favorite uh, bakery to get that favorite pastry of yours. I know that's a problem that my, one of my clients is facing that right now, right? So you'll save time and yet then you'll save energy because you won't have to think about it anymore. And maybe you'll pay more attention to things that truly matter to you, like your business, or your clients, or your family, or your home. And then you'll be able to create progress in those areas too. Let's see what would happen with your family, for instance, and maybe you'll be a role model with your loved one if they see you stopping mid biscuit or mid pasta, because you're noticing that your satiety, you're noticing your satiety, maybe they'll just want to follow your example, right? Maybe they'll see you eating more mindfully and if your kids are like mine, they would simply do exactly the same as you. And it's super fun to see them mimic you and eat what you eat, the way you eat, even when they're 20. I can guarantee that. All right. Just to do what money does. It's super fun. And you, maybe you'll be able to use the extra money that you're saving, on the other hand, to actually do fun activities as a family, like maybe trips or going to Euro Disney or things like that. And maybe you'll be able to take pleasure, a lot of pressure, pleasure in meal, at meal times, right? Um, as far as society is concerned, maybe you'll be proud to contribute to a society where you no longer consume as much processed food as you used to, right? So those are the things that we get, we change externally, right? We change society, we change our family, these behaviors, but we also mostly, of course, change ourselves. That's the first thing. Now there's the internal change, who we become when we stop uh, overeating, when we stop reacting, responding to an urge, to a food craving by actually eating the food, right? So there's who you become, same thing for yourself, and then the ripple effects for your family, your loved ones, your society in general, and so on. So let's start with yourself. Well, you can feel proud or accomplished or more and more confident day after day, right? When you notice a nerd, when you notice a food craving, and maybe it's just noticing it, which is already huge, when you pause and you actually don't respond to it, right? Instead of waiting, as we do when we try to lose weight, for that elusive big finale far away on the horizon, yeah, you get to feel proud right now, today, just because you've noticed something, just because you're trying something new maybe, all right? And then in the process of conquering your food cravings for good, you learn how to trust yourself. You learn how to trust that you will eat what you said you would eat. You learn how to trust yourself that you're not going to eat what you said you wouldn't eat, that you're going to do what you said you would do. That's huge. For me, it was the most important thing, right? That I'm able to trust myself. Yes, I'm going to do this because I've decided, this is what I've decided to do. That's really changed so much for me, right? Um, and what's super fun is that this is going to have a ripple effect in other areas of your life. We start with food, but actually think about all the other cravings that we have, like the, the craving to scroll a phone, the craving to uh, click on a, a, a new a new window or to gossip or to bite our nails or to come on, let's just have another another episode of the series or the TV show or the podcast. It's just this is going to help in those areas too. 
without you actually wanting to, you're going to notice the changes because it's exactly the same process. That's why I'm really, really passionate about cravings, that the effect when we conquer them, as far as food is concerned, the effect are tremendous in our life. So that's why I'm so, I love them so much, right? And let's uh, think also about the obsession about the food. When you conquer your food cravings for good, you won't be obsessed about food. I don't know about you, but when I was deep, um, deep in that relationship with food that was not serving me, I had those questions in my mind all the time. When's the next meal? What am I going to eat? Will it be enough? And then what? And who's going to have the last piece of cake? Please let it be me. <laughs> Right, but when once you've conquered your food cravings for good, you'll experience food freedom, and that's huge. You gain so much brain space. So something else that I've noticed is that because I was expecting food to change the way I was feeling, I was really um, trying to, to have food to feel a void in me. But since we learn doing this work, we learn how to feel proud, accomplished, confident, trustworthy, and so on, self-reliant, you name it, empowered, without consuming anything, right? When we learn how to do that, then we no longer feel that void, right? We no longer feel this need to feel a void with something external. We take care of the void by ourselves, and that's also huge. It's so much better this way, right? But remember also that when, if you overeat, chances are, if you're like my clients, most of my clients, you feel guilt, you feel shame after overeating. Imagine being free of that shame, being free of the guilt, right? Just like as if you were putting the suitcases down, that's it. And imagine dropping the shame altogether and being willing to appear in photos, in family photos, right? Instead of hiding and hoping that you it won't get noticed. And same thing, when you see a mirror, instead of thinking, oh gosh, no, not again. I don't like that. Just being proud and taking pose. <laughs> wouldn't that be fun, right? Imagine dancing and actually wanting to look at you in the mirror, wanting to look at your reflection in the mirror and taking pleasure in this, right? Whether you're at your goal weight or not, you don't have to have reached a certain goal weight, a certain size, a certain body size to actually take pleasure in seeing yourself. I can teach you that, no problem, right? Reconciling, becoming friends with yourself right now, I can teach you that and it's essential. It's so much fun. It feels so good, all right? And chances are that if you conquer your food cravings for good, you won't be as worried, you won't be as afraid of having health issues in the future, right? Of course, we can't promise that, of course, you'll never ever have a health issues. We know it doesn't work this way, right? But at least you can drop the worry, you can drop the fear in the moment, okay? This, right now, you'll feel fine and that's so important. And also something that's super important for me is that you'll feel in control around food. You'll know for sure that you're not a victim of the chocolate chip cookies or the ice cream or the pizza, right? You're not a victim of the food industry, right? You'll feel empowered wherever you are, whatever food's in front of you. You'll be just like Freddie Mercury, which, who's one of my heroes, and he said, I decide who I am. You'll be able to decide who you are when there's food around you, okay? And also something that my clients have told me is that they now take pleasure in cooking and eating, right? And for myself, I'm starting to cook more because I don't also have this story that, oh no, food, oh, I'm such a mess as far as food is concerned, so let's not even cook, right? Let's avoid the topic altogether, right? But it could be fun. And also you could simply be happy and fulfilled because you know how to generate a happiness, that fulfillment within you without relying on food or beverages, right? That's super powerful too. You'll be self-confident. You know you can feel down and not need to change it. You know, you will know that you can survive whatever emotion you're currently feeling. You will know that it will pass and you don't have to make it a problem, 
right? And as far as your family is concerned, maybe something that my clients have told me and that I'm noticing too is that I'm much more present with my loved ones, all right? Like for instance, um, when I'm not hungry, instead of trying to find something to do like watching TV or I simply can sit and enjoy looking at my kids. That's it. I'm not doing anything but looking at my kids and taking so much pleasure in seeing their faces and their expressions and so on and hearing, listening to them. I don't need to do anything else, right? Being present with them, it's already wonderful. That's what I call optimizing pleasure. And I think it's super important because saying no to temptation doesn't mean saying no to pleasure. On the contrary, it means developing, optimizing, right? Exploring pleasure. So good. And I got to feel connected with my kids even more because I'm paying attention to them, right? I'm starting conversations with them because there's not this chatter in my mind about food all the time. So it's also much, e much, more, much easier to start a conversation and to have a deep, meaningful conversation with my kids when my mouth is not full all the time. Fancy that. And also, well, you being the role model for your kids can make you feel even more connected to yourself, to them too, right? They can rely on you. You can exchange also on how they do that. I know that for my son, he can stop meat biscuits and just say, oh, I'm full. I can get curious about that. Whereas before I was just like, oh, something's wrong with me. I can never do that. But right now I'm just, oh, how do you do that? What's going on for you? What's your process, right? And also, as far as society is concerned, I told you there's a ripple effect. As far as society is concerned, you'll be able to bring this new skill set, not answering the urges, not saying yes to temptation all the time, to other areas of your life where you're noticing you're trying to avoid an emotion and create an artificial emotion with something else. As I said, social media, Netflix, to feel better. You'll be able to also be an example of what's possible to all the people around you not just your family, maybe your colleagues, maybe your clients, maybe right people you meet on the street, right? So all you need to do to recap is to ask yourself those two questions when you notice yourself reaching for the extra food, right? And simply noticing, by the way, I want to celebrate because that's not easy. When we're in this automaticity on autopilot, simply noticing something that's already huge, simply noticing it in the moment, wow mind-blowing, congratulations, but also noticing it afterwards, that's already something to celebrate. You don't have to blame yourself for having overeaten, for instance, but simply noticing it and being aware that, oh, I did something I didn't want to do. Good to know. That's also huge. Okay. So here are the two questions again, and I'm going to add a third one. So the first one is, how am I feeling right now? Right. The second question is, how do I want to feel? And what's super fun, of course, is to check with yourself. I was expecting um, to feel this way thanks to the food. Now, the third question could be, how am I truly feeling after eating the food? We're not preventing ourselves from eating the food, even if we know that's not really what we want. No, let's use that in our experiment, right? To get to know ourselves better, to get to know the truth, which will help us actually decline the food next time much more easily rather than if we resist and think, okay, I know I want the food for that reason. I know it's not going to give me this emotion that I want, this ecstasy that I'm looking for. So let's not go there. No, what about actually going there and checking, right? Instead of saying, no, 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 which actually is going to make it harder, right? Because at some point with that willpower, you'll run out of that willpower and you'll go to the other extreme and you'll want to eat completely again and again and again much more. So let's check really, truly, let's explore how am I truly feeling after eating the food or when I eat the food, okay? Do I get to feel that emotion that I was looking for, right? So if you, for instance, wanted to feel that ecstasy, like me and the cookie, do you feel actually ecstatic? And if you're like me and most of my clients, what I've noticed is that after the third bite, the excess is gone. The magic is gone, right? So that's a game changer. That helped me get rid of lots of foods that actually are not giving me any pleasure apart from the first three bites. And even so, sometimes it's not even there, right? So 
Um, what I've noticed, another story that I want to share with you, what I've noticed recently is that I'm feeling an urge to accept the candies that my daughter offers me, right? And so the, the emotion I feel before is this urge. I feel this desire, the craving for the candy. The second question, remember, is what is the emotion I think I'm going to feel when I accept the food, if I eat the food, right? And really, I got to understand, which is what I help my clients do, understand why they want to eat the food and then decrease this longing for the food and then decline the food easily, right? So what I've understood from myself is that I want to feel connected, right? I want to feel connected. And I think that if I eat the candy that my daughter's giving me, then I get to feel connected. So of course I say yes, except that it's not actually the way it, it, it works. First of all, I want to feel connected, but in my head, that means that we, she and I, are going to feel connected together. But me eating the candy doesn't mean she will feel connected. It doesn't work this way, right? And then the second thing that's really interesting for me to know is that I can feel connected to my daughter, whether I eat the candy or not. The candy is not the thing providing the emotion. I get to feel connected because I choose to think, oh, we're so much alike. We're, so, we're having such a good time together. That creates the connection, the true, the real connection for me, with or without the candy, right? Because what I've also noticed, and that the answer to the third question, how do I really feel when I eat the candy? Do I feel connected? Well, unfortunately, I've realized that, no, nope, it's just a story I had, indeed. As I suspected, the candy can't make me feel connected. Actually, it's the opposite that happens because I feel disconnected from myself, right? When I eat the candy, it's not what I want to feel. It's not what I want in my body. So I want to feel something else, an emotion, not this sensation of feeling super excited because of the sugar. That's not what I want. I want that connection. And the candy is not here. It was never there <laughs> to give me that emotion of connection. So it's good to know that this candy story is actually not serving me. Right? I can take that, put it in my little library <laughs> of thoughts that don't serve me, and next time my daughter is offering me a candy, I will remember. It doesn't mean that necessarily I'll stop eating the candy altogether. It might take some time, but at least I know exactly what's going on. And understanding, as I said, this is the first step, then decreasing the food craving is exactly what we do when we bring this story back to the forefront. And we, oh yeah, that's when I want to feel connected. And that's when I forget that the candy can never make me feel connected to my daughter. So it can be a super fun exercise to explore for you. And you're going to uncover so many things about you by just asking yourself those three questions. So I'm saying that it's going to be super fun, but actually it may not be super easy for you. And here are two reasons why. The first one is that I'm speaking of emotions, but you may have no idea what feelings, emotions are actually. And I know that for myself, I had no clue, no vocabulary as far as emotions were concerned six years ago before I started to do this work, this thought work, this emotional work. But it's, the good news is that it's like anything else in life, we can learn it by practicing. And if you Google it, on the internet, there are plenty of feelings lists. There's also an emotional wheel that's super convenient. And then it's just a matter of deciding to use them, practicing them. And then, of course, you're going to be fluent as far as emotions are concerned. So there's hope. Don't worry about that. Right. And we can learn so many things as human beings. Remember, I used to be a binge eater. I used to snack all the time. And even if it took me 30 years because I didn't have the tools, I got there. Right. I stopped binge eating. I stopped snacking all the time. I stopped relying on food for my day to day, in my day to day, right? So I really want you also to know that there's nothing extraordinary about me. The only thing that really helped me get out of this loop is that I wanted to, right? So if you're watching this video, if you've made it that far, it means that you also want to change. It is possible for you too, right? So that's the first obstacle that could be there for you between you doing this exercise and Right, you finding and covering so many things. You don't have the, the emotional vocabulary right now, which makes perfect sense. So I invite you to um, get a feelings list or in, an emotional will from the, the internet and try and do this exercise. 
because it may be simply, simply solved, right? The second thing, the second reason why you may not find it easy to do this exercise of the three questions around your cravings could be this. You may be reluctant to find out about those two, three emotions. And then again, I get it because I remember that I was so scared of what I was going to find. I was scared of finding my emotions and or finding my thoughts rather and discovering that I was a freak, that I was a monster. So instead of discovering that I was a freak, I would rather, I wanted actually to avoid finding that. So I was not willing to actually learn anything from my behavior because I was, I was thinking, well, if I find that at if I find that I'm a freak, it's going to be even worse. So let's avoid that. That was really the first thing. I was terrified. It took me a long time to actually realize that the sentences in my mind, the emotions that I, were fe I was feeling were actually very, very mundane, very common, very ordinary, right? So it took me the longest time to be really curious because I was so scared. And I really needed the help of a coach to actually go there. I couldn't go on my own. The truth is that really what I uncovered was super simple. I just want to feel stimulated. Ooh, that looks good. Or I can't want to keep the fun going. Or, Ooh, that's going to make me feel better, right? No big deal. But I didn't know that because I had this story in my mind that I'm going to uncover something so deep, so terrible that I'm not going to survive, right? And also, as far as emotions is concerned, are concerned, I thought that feeling an emotion meant that I would not be able to survive. I couldn't go there because it was going to be so big that I'm, I'm going to die on the spot. It's actually the opposite. It's actually the reverse, right? When you resist your emotions, they're still there, right? And I was making them bigger by not looking at them. But actually, when you look at them, it's just like a, a souffle. It's just, bloop. <laughs> you look at them and bloop it crumbles. But I didn't know that. So that's why I'm telling you this, all right? So, of course, if you need somebody who's kind, who's trustworthy, who's experienced in having a look at those emotions that you may be afraid to look at, I'm here for you, right? I can help you. I've done that for four years now, a bit more than four years. I've done it for myself, which was the most life-changing work I've ever done. And I'm really happy to give you a hand and to help you explore what's making you rich for the food and I can help you conquer your food cravings for good. All you need to do really is have a look below this video and there will be a link to my online calendar which is on Calendly and simply click the link, book a session, find a, a slot that suits you then there will be a few questions for you to answer and we'll meet. We'll meet, we'll have a chat for one hour where we're going to explore really what you want, what's possible for you, right? What is, it, what is your dream life like? What is your dream health or body like, right? We're going to let ourselves dream big, okay? And then another exercise that's super fun is that we're actually going to find ways to go there, to actually make this dream come true. And of course, I know one path because I've created a toolkit that's perfect for you to reach that goal. But then we may find that that's not the thing for you. No problem there, right? What's interesting is that at the end of this call together, you'll have found your path, right? You'll have made your decision, whether it's to want work to work with me or not, or to find something else, no problem, right? But you'll be clear as to what you want to do to reach that dream, right? So I'm really inviting you to click that link and join me for this free Crave Control Consultation call so that we get to meet, we get to chat, we get to dream big, and we get to create your path. And then, because I believe that you're the expert of your life, I'm not, nobody else is, you can make a decision that suits you. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And I'm going to wish you a beautiful rest of your day. I'll, take, I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.